Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Jeju Forum for Peace and Prosperity 2019. I'm An Cha Ki, the Director of Global Affairs at Chungang Ilbo, which is a co-host of this annual gathering. Now, the Jeju Forum is in its 14th year. It started back in 2001 as a platform for multilateral collaboration to explore ways of realizing peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula and East Asia. This year's Jeju Forum is being held under the theme, as you know, Asia Towards Resilient Peace, Collaboration, Cooperation rather, and Integration. And how apt this theme has turned out to be considering all that has happened over the past few weeks and months. So without a doubt, this is the most timely opportunity to review and even redraw a blueprint for the future of Asia, together with all the experts uh, and global leaders gathered here today. Uh, as is the case, each year we have a very distinguished lineup of dignitaries here with us, and I would like to spend a little time to introduce them to you. When I call out their names, please give each and every one of them a big round of applause. All right, ladies and gentlemen, former President of Austria, His Excellency Heinz Fischer. Former Prime Minister of Australia, His Excellency Malcolm Turnbull. Former Prime Minister of Japan, His Excellency Yukio Hatoyama. Former Foreign Minister of China, His Excellency Li Jiaoxing. The Secretary General of ASEAN, His Excellency Dato Lim Jokhoi. The Union Minister for the Office of the State Councillor of Myanmar, His Excellency Zhou Tinche. And the host of the Jeju Forum for Peace and Prosperity, His Excellency Governor Won Hiryong. Uh, former UN Secretary General Pan Ki-moon was very much looking forward to joining all, all of us here, but uh, regrettably he is not able to be here this morning due to an urgent family matter. We hope you all understand. Well, I'm here to make sure that everything works like clockwork, and the time tells me that it is time to move on with this opening ceremony. So I would like to invite the chairman of the organizing committee, the Jeju Forum Organizing Committee, His Excellency Governor Won Hee-ryong, up to the stage for his opening remarks. I think he needs some help. Yes, we don't want him to exert um, his leg at this point. We need it to heal. Yes, Governor Won Hee-ryong will come up to the podium to deliver his opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome him with a big hand. Welcome to the Jeju Forum for Peace and Prosperity 2019. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge some of our most distinguished guests for their endeavors to advance world peace and human prosperity. Former President of Austria, Heinz Fischer, former Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, former Prime Minister of Japan, Yukio Hatoyama, former Foreign Minister of People's Republic of China, Li Jiaoxing. Thank you for being here, and I owe you my special thanks. I'm also delighted to welcome all the distinguished guests, both local and abroad, as well as Jeju citizens, who would share ideas to promote prosperous and peaceful Asia. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, 
from local and abroad, our world is now facing serious peacelessness challenges. This includes natural hazard triggered by climate change, ocean contamination caused by littering plastic waste, and transnational air pollution due to elusive particulate matter. They have become global risks because they pose a greater threat than ever to human survival and peace. In other words, our world is recognized peace to have become inclusive of areas other than just national security. This is why Seju is striving to realize this new peace by shifting to the widened concept. Accordingly, the range of peace discourse in this Jeju Forum is not limited merely to traditional security issues, but expanded to a variety of fields such as economy, culture, environment, etc. By the way, I proposed at the Jeju Forum 2015, peace from healing, that is a gift from clean Jeju nature, peace from tolerance, that we gain by being inclusive of multiple values and interests, and peace in energy, that directs us to achieve peace in the entire energy process from generation to consumption. Along those lines, we are advancing carbon-free island 2030 projects, where all our power generation will shift to alternative energy and our passenger vehicles will be replaced by electric ones. Recently, we commit ourselves in tackling the transnational issue of fine dust and push forward a dust-free Jeju campaign. Jeju is proud of its blue sky, fresh air, and clean natural environment. It is an environment treasure island endorsed by UNESCO. We have set clean and coexistence as a future vision of Jeju to boost this resilience of environment and ecosystem. We will make our effort with confidence and commitment in both expanding and sharing the new values and experiences of our own with the world as well as the central government of South Korea. Distinguished guests from local and abroad. As you know, the Jeju Forum introduced the, as its theme for this year, Asia Towards Resilient Peace, Cooperation and Integration. Resilient peace is an effective way to turn insecure peace into a secured one and to find a balance point to realize sustainable coexistence even under secret crisis. In their heart, Jeju people have the deepest wounds that remain from the turmoil of the Cold War 71 years ago. Countless innocent lives were lost and many communities were destroyed. But the Jeju people have stuck together in order to resolve the division and conflict of the April 3rd incident in a spirit of reconciliation and coexistence. The government of South Korea acknowledged the Jeju people as having been overcoming the painful history of the April 3rd incident and commemorate this by enlisting Jeju Island as an island of world peace in 2005. This has served as a momentum for the Jeju government and citizens to share the belief that we are all victims of the painful history of the April 3rd incident, and to make efforts to realize the resilient peace through which we feel tolerance for each other and heal together. Since in its resolving the April 3rd incident, Jeju made the case of advancing reconciliation and coexistence, as well as peace and human rights, through tolerance and healing. I anticipate the case of Jeju to exemplify the modest operandi for Asia to establish 
vigilant peace in Asia. Distinguished guests from local and abroad, North Korea's denuclearization issue is probably the biggest risk to global security. Unprecedented summits at such short interval have brought us hope that North Korea will declare its denuclearization and the international community should take part in initiating a denuclearization process. But the second summit between North Korea and US held in Hanoi, Vietnam, and with the so-called Hanoi No Deal. The core condition of determining nuclear deal is truthfulness. It has been demonstrated that dialogue without truthfulness cannot solve a nuclear puzzle. It's the denuclearization that will guarantee North Korea its regime security and help North Koreans to meet the basic necessities of life and live as human beings. On top of it all, the international community will provide North Korea with support and cooperation to boost its economy. I cannot stress enough the importance of the North Korea's denuclearization. It will determine the future of North Korea. It will also help the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. I call on North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to make a truthful resolution on denuclearization. We, two Koreas and the international community, will bravely and patiently support North Korea's denuclearization and be committed to helping with this normalization. Jeju will actively take its part in this move too. Jeju special self-governing provincial government has been the first among Korean local governments to pioneer inter-Korean exchanges by means of vitamin C diplomacy. As Jeju has been playing a leading role in inter-Korean exchanges, next year we'll invite North Korea to join this Jeju forum so that it can pro provide an opportunity to start a grand new chapter of establishing a peace process in the Korean Peninsula. <clears throat> Distinguished guests from local and abroad, Jeju Forum began in 2001, so it has been uh, almost 20 years since his birth. During this period, period Many influential global leaders of politics, academics, and business all around 80 countries have taken part here. It's become a model public forum representing South Korea where the agenda of peace and prosperity is discussed. This forum will be a center stage in Asia on which collective responses based on extended peace concept take place to deal with new peace threats, including, including climate change, ocean contamination, and fine dust, as well as the traditional security threats, such as nuclear weapons and missiles. In particular, with a new peace concept in mind, peace from healing, peace from tolerance, and peace in energy will preserve the environmental trade island where environment and human can coexist. Also, we will not forget to play our role as an island of world peace. I hope all of you will enjoy the splendid spring of clean blue jazz during your stay in this environment trade island. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Won, for your remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, could we have another Round of big applause for Governor Won Hee Ryong. And now it's time for keynote speeches from the global leaders with us this morning on the main theme of this year's 
forum, which is Asia Towards Resilient Peace. And so I would like to invite former president of Austria, His Excellency Heinz Fischer, up to the podium for his keynote speech. Everyone, let's please welcome President Fischer. Mr. Chairman, Governor Vaughan, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great honor and pleasure for me to be invited to the Jeju Peace Forum 2019 and coming from Austria to contribute to the topic of Asia towards resilient peace from a European perspective. What does, what lead to resilient peace in Europe in the last decades? And what were some of the major lessons learned? Distinguished participants, I want to focus on three main lessons from our European history. First lesson, balanced cooperation between adversaries at eye level is very, very important. Second lesson, economic collaboration with a shared plan and goals has a big influence on peaceful relations. And third lesson, upholding the generally accepted international treaty regime is necessary to build trust. And we need trust. Let me elaborate by quickly looking back on historic developments that led to those lessons in Europe. After the French Revolution, the turbulences of the Napoleonic Wars had troubled and shaked whole Europe. However, in 1815, the Congress of Vienna developed a new system of European balance of power between Great Britain, France, Germany, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and Russia. And this balance lasted for almost 100 years, and it is Professor Henry Kissinger who very often describes this balance of power in his books as an example of resilient and lasting peace. This lesson is still useful for today's challenges because power needs balancing power at eye level, in the essence of Kissinger's strategic thinking. At the beginning of the 20th century, the destructive powers of selfish nationalism in Central Europe became stronger and stronger. The consequence was the outbreak of World War I. Central European powers against the coalition of Great Britain, France, Russia, and in the last phase of the war, the United States. The Central European powers lost the war, and the peace treaties from 1919 were dictated rather than negotiated. Regimes acted on the premise of winners and losers, those that could dictate and those that had to obey. And this was contributing to inflaming and initiating again strong nationalistic feelings, in particular through the Nazi movement in Germany and similar movement in other parts of Europe. And only 20 years after the end of World War I, the Second World War started. But then, after World War II, several lessons from history were learned by the participating nations. Roosevelt, Churchill, De Gaulle and other leaders did not, the mistake, did not make the mistakes of 1918 and 1919 again. Democracy, human rights, and the new understanding of lasting peace became leading principles after World War II. In Austria we say the Second Republic. The dominating new idea was that economic cooperation 
between former enemies, in particular between Germany and France, should be so strong that political cooperation becomes a necessary consequence and war becomes hopefully impossible. This was the basis for the European integration. The second element of post-war peace was the Marshall Plan, which helped to build Europe up after the Second World War, but evidently also helped the United States to foster its economic positioning. It was, so to say, a win-win situation for former adversaries. Economic cooperation makes political cooperation easier. And the third lesson was to secure all of this by a generally accepted international multinational treaty regime. International treaties and institutions secured trust and displayed goodwill for political and economic cooperation. The most important institution was, and still is, as you know, the United Nations, which was created in 1945, followed, for instance, by the Council of Europe, created in 1949, and the Treaty of Rome in 1957 was giving the European integration a clear institutional framework. A big problem after 1945, of course, was the contradiction and even antagonism between the so-called East and the West from a European perspective, namely between the Soviet Union and its allies and the United States and its allies. One could also say between NATO and Warsaw Pact. There was a dangerous period, but both sides tried to limit the risk of war. Willy Brandt, the German prime minister in the 1970s, decorated with the Nobel Peace Prize, whom I personally appreciated very much, once said, I quote, peace is not everything, but everything is nothing without peace. In my opinion, he was and is right. The collapse of the communist system in Europe and the disintegration of the Soviet Union 30 years ago again changed the situation. European integration became more and more successful. Many countries under communist dictatorship changed to more democratic system after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and East and West Germany were united again peacefully. I know that this was observed very closely from Korea. Unfortunately, the peak of these positive developments was reached at the turn to the 21st century, at least from a European point of view. The worldwide financial crisis was producing economic and political tensions and problems. The political climate and stability started to deteriorate, at least to change. The extension of NATO to the Russian border was, in my opinion, without negotiations, and those negotiations would have been very difficult, but was not a very wise decision. Egoistic and nationalistic tendencies were growing. Nowadays, in the United States, President Trump is very visible, relying on a my country first policy, antagonistic to the lessons we had already learned in the past. A peaceful future, in my opinion, lies in cooperation, not in confrontation. In addition, the elections of the European Parliament last Sunday have produced also significant changes and shifting seats and influence from the center to a more nationalistic right. 
are these European lessons also relevant for Asia? I think all historical lessons, all of these lessons are to a certain extent global ones. I de therefore, my conclusions are, as I indicated at the beginning. First, never keep up striving for balanced cooperation of adversaries. Only if one seeks cooperation instead of confrontation, major, major challenges can be overcome. Europe unified when the old and adversaries Germany and France intertwined their war-related sectors of economy. Second, aim for collaboration with a shared goal. The United Nation, Nations have given the global community, and it was particular Ban Ki-moon, and I thank him again and again, a solid plan for the future of our planet. It is the Sustainable Development Goals, which can be very well seen as a global plan for governing, for government's goals all over the globe. And third, everyone needs to do the utmost to uphold the generally accepted international treaty regime. Because only in an atmosphere of trust and mutual respect for agreements, the global community will succeed to find the necessary balanced solutions to different interests. In my opinion, the decision of President Trump, and I want to put it carefully and politely, to withdraw from the INF, from the Paris Climate Agreement, and from the Joint Comprehension Plan of Action with Iran were not very helpful decisions. This makes, for instance, the very difficult negotiations between South and North Korea even more difficult if the trust in agreements is even only a little bit shaky. Distinguished participants, in my opinion, we have learned a lot from the dramatic history of the 20th century. But it seems, on the other hand, we just begin to forget some of the important lessons of history. Now it is our and your responsibility to make sure that those lessons from history remain guiding principles for a peaceful future. And at the same time, new ideas must be implemented in our actions in order to master the problems of the next and the following generation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, President Fischer, for sharing your speech with us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for the next speech of this morning, and we would like to ask Prime Minister the former Prime Minister of Australia, Mr. Malcolm Turnbull, to take the stage for his keynote address. Ladies and gentlemen, please give the Prime Minister a big hand as he wakes, makes his way up to the podium. Thank you very much. Uh, Governor Wan Hirong, uh, thank you so much for uh, it, holding this forum, inviting us here today, and I I will not uh, enumerate all the distinguished prime ministers and former presidents here today, but it, we are all honoured uh, to be here in Jeju. Uh, your vision for a resilient peace in our region is as inspiring as it is timely. I want to uh, thank you for the extraordinary hospitality that you've shown and the way in which the forum is addressing so many of the threats to peace and the ways in which we can work together to meet them. Your invitation to Kim and Chim, Kim Jong-un to come to Jeju for the Peace Forum is very timely. It is, really is. And if, like me and the United States Ambassador Admiral Harris did yesterday, if, uh, like Harry and I, walked up Halasan, uh, if Kim Jong-un does that, he will be doubly inspired to work harder towards peace. 
And peace here on the Korean Peninsula has been hard won. Australians, 17,000 of them, served to defend South Korea's freedom nearly 70 years ago, and 340 paid the supreme sacrifice. The battlefield was far from Australia, but the cause of freedom was close to our heart. As it is today, we stand side by side in supporting the rules-based order. The rule of law is the foundation for peace and prosperity in this vibrant region, a region of so much economic opportunity. Our nations understand that the key to maximizing those opportunities is our support for free trade and open markets. As former President Heinz Fischer just reminded us, economic cooperation makes political cooperation easier. Now, Korea is Australia's fourth largest two-way trading partner. The Korea-Australia Free Trade Agreement came into effect in December 2014, slashing tariffs and ensuring that 99% of Australian exports into Korea enter duty-free or with preferential access. Those deals make our economies stronger and they create more opportunities for our people. Perhaps just as importantly, they create strategic partnerships which aid in upholding that rules-based order. We are stronger when we work together, and we understand that more than ever, as the world enters uncertain geopolitical times, that the Asian region has a greater role to play in the global community. This is the center of the global economy today. Now, Japanese Prime Minister Abe Shinzo and I showed how influential our region can be when we revived the Trans-Pacific Partnership after President Trump withdrew in 2017. Many, I would say almost everybody, said the Trans-Pacific Partnership was dead. However, Shinzo and I found a way to keep it going and to convince the rest of the region, the rest of the part parties to the TPP, it was not. So it had been a TPP-12, it's now the TPP-11, but it is still one of the world's largest trading deals, trade deals, joining $13 trillion worth of economies together. And I hope that before too long, the Republic of Korea will join the TPP and it will be a TPP-12 once more. The region has seen the greatest economic growth and human advancement the world's ever known over the last 40 years, just 40 years, has seen this extraordinary growth. In these, these times in which we live of change that is unprecedented both in its scale and its pace are the most exciting times in human history. And we should therefore be optimistic about the future. But with all of those opportunities come risk. Strong economies create stronger militaries and military capability. Increased wealth creates a stronger strategic ambition among nations. Combine strategic ambition with military strength and you create potential regional flashpoints, flashpoints to which we must be alert. And that's why more than ever before, we have to share these challenges with trusted allies and friends in our region. Now, while the Cold War is long behind us, and again, President Fisher spoke so uh, magnificently about the history of Europe and the history of the Cold War and its legacy, uh, there is a tendency still to focus on the superpowers, China and the United States, and certainly recent tensions encourage us to do that. But it is the wrong perspective. We should not think of the nations in our region connecting only via the capitals of the superpowers like spokes connecting to the hub of a wheel, but rather as an interconnected mesh supporting each other, defending the rule of law, which ensures that might is not right. Uh, you know, Graham Allison is here uh, at this conference uh, who wrote a superb work about the Thucydides trap. And he refers to the first chapter of the Athenian general Thucydides' history of the war between Athens and Sparta, in which Thucydides goes through all of the various 
uh, events that caused this great war, but said, summed it up, but said the real reason was that the uh, Spartans were anxious about the rising power of Athens. And this Thucydides trap, President Xi Jinping has talked about being an important one for China to avoid as its power grows, and that anxiety about rising power can cause uh, conflict, and that from that alone. And that's a very important insight, and Professor Allison's done an enormous service in uh, uh, reacquainting everyone with that great history. But the real, ob the real objective for us in this region, the countries that are not one of the two great superpowers, not China or the United States, what we have to ensure is that we do not uh, fall into the situation described in another book of Thucydides' history, Book 5, where the Athenian ambassadors go to the island of Milos and demand that it submit. And when the Melians said, we want to stay independent, uh, we want to be free, the Athenians said, you know as well as we do that in the world justice is found only as between equals in power, as for the rest the strong do as they will and the weak suffer as they must. And that is what we must not allow in our region. We must work together to defend the rule of law to ensure that might is not right. And this was the objective of my government's foreign policy explained in the foreign affairs in our foreign policy white paper and evident in practical outcomes, not just the TPP-11, but also a free trade agreement and comprehensive strategic partnership with our closest neighbour, Indonesia, one of whose former foreign ministers, Marty Natalagawa, is here with us today. Uh, you can see how important this reaching out has also been in uh, Prime Minister Abe's foreign policy. While Prime Minister Abe has been a very generous host to President Trump, especially in the last few days, note how he is also busy in every other capital, extending Japan's global reach and influence. Now, Australia has always been rock solid in its support for South Korea as it stands up to threats from the North Korean regime. As Prime Minister, I supported the imposition of tougher sanctions on North Korea and our military are working with our allies to support the enforcement of them. China's enforcement of sanctions has been particularly important. And while China is absolutely not responsible for the reckless conduct of North Korea, it does have the greatest economic leverage over the regime. So China's cooperation in putting pressure on the North Korean regime has been absolutely critical. Now, ultimately, the deal that can be done would, as uh, Governor Wan uh, described, would be a security guarantee, in effect, from the United States and China in return for complete denuclearization. There has been talk about historic precedents, and at one point, uh, Libya was mentioned, which was hardly an encouraging one from Kim Jong-un's point of view. The better precedent, however, is Cuba, where more than 50 years ago, the United States agreed with the Soviet Union that if the nuclear missiles were removed, it would not seek to overthrow the communist regime in Havana. That assurance has been complied with ever since, notwithstanding the fall decades ago of the Soviet Union. The mistake the United States made with Cuba, however, was for domestic political reasons within the United States to maintain an economic embargo on that island, which simply served to entrench the Castro regime. That's a lesson that can be learnt in the future uh, discussions and negotiations with North Korea. So in my view, President Trump has the right objective with North Korea in return for denuclearization and end to sanctions and an assurance that the United States will not take advantage of that denuclearization to overthrow the regime. Our region is the most dynamic in the world, a region of unlimited economic opportunities and growth. We should continue to encourage free trade and open markets. We want to see the Trans-Pacific Partnership expand and, in due course, the United States return to the TPP. Greater strategic alliances uh, and are an, enable us to welcome uh, and work with China in its economic advancement. The growth of China's economy has been the most remarkable achievement. Hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty, a country that, in the, when uh, 
when um, Deng Xiaoping went south and uh, invoked the uh, memory of the, uh, the great uh, Chinese uh, uh, trader, the great Chinese admiral uh, that ventured across the Indian Ocean. When Deng did that, China's trade was a fraction of global trade. Now it is, depending on the measure, either the largest or the second largest economy in the world. So it's been a remarkable transformation and the region has benefited from it, but what has enabled it has been the maintenance of peace and the rules-based order, and that's what we must continue. It's vital that, that like-minded nations like Korea, like Japan, like Australia are partners in a united coalition. We achieve so much more when we work together. And President Fisher again uh, reminds us of how important that shared democratic vision is to secure peace. So I thank you again, Governor Wan, for, for inviting me here today. It's a great honour. It's, it's inspiring to be here with you all committed to peace and the maintenance of the rules-based order in Asia, uh, which has seen the most remarkable transformation from poverty to prosperity in all of human history. Peace has made it possible, and the maintenance of that peace must be our goal. In the words of the 34th Psalm, we should seek peace and pursue it, pursue it relentlessly, tirelessly, regardless of how many disappointments there are along the way, because that goal is what will enable us to maintain our prosperity and our freedom in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, for that very inspiring speech. We look forward to delving into those topics more in the World Leaders session later. Now we would like to ask His Excellency Yukio Hatoyama, the former Prime Minister of Japan, to take the podium for his keynote speech. Everyone, let's please welcome Prime Minister Hatoyama. ヒロンチジドの いうことでございますので、早く回復をされて、あと昨日私は、チェジュ 4.3 大きく変わる可能性が出てきたのではないかと期待をしているところでございます。この という
1956年に日ソ国交回復を成し遂げて引退をいたしました彼は戦後間もなく総理になるチャンスはあったんでありますが組閣の前日に追放処分となりました追放され成功うどくの日々の中でリハウト・クーデンホフ・カレルギー博の著書「全体主義国家対人間」を読んでその彼に浸水をして彼の友愛の理念に共鳴をしその著書,を著書を「自由と人生」という日本語の名前の本に翻訳をいたしましたそして政界復帰した一郎は友愛を相互尊重相互理解相互扶助という概念に説いて友愛社会の実現に力を注いだのでございます私は友愛こそ政治が必要とする共通の善ではないかと思うのでございます母が日本人でオー,ストラリア人オーストリア人でございますクーデンホフ・カルルギー博は自由と平等の架け橋として友愛の大切さを説きました20世紀の初頭ヒトラーとスターリンの2つの全体主義に覆われていたヨーロッパにおいて全体主義と戦う思想として友愛を提唱したのでございます彼は友愛の理念に基づいて反ヨーロッパ主義を唱えそれが第二次世界大戦後欧州石炭鉄鋼共同体を生む基礎となったのでございますそれまで憎しみ合っていたドイツとフランスの両国は石炭や鉄鋼の共同管理をはじめとした協力を積み重ねたのでありますさらにドイツフランスを中心としてヨーロッパ周辺諸国へも経済を中心として協力関係が深まり右翼曲折,右翼曲折がありましたけれどもその動きは今日の EU へと結実してまいったのであります。今、ドイツとフランスが再び戦争を行うとは誰も想像しなくなりました。ヨーロッパが事実上の伏線共同体となったのでございます。私が申し上げたいのは、友愛という考え方は決して過去の理念ではなくて、今の世界の政治においてこそ、最も大切な理念ではないかと思っていることでございます友愛とは自己の尊厳の尊重とともに他人の尊厳をも同じように尊重することでございます自分の自由を尊重しながら他人の自由に対しても尊重してお互いに違いを認めて個性を生かし合うそして助け合うことでございます別の表現をすれば友愛は自立と共生に因数分解できます。自分が自立しようと努力することで、己の尊厳が尊重されるのであります。しかしながら、自分一人では生きてはいけませんから、他者と自分が異なる存在であることを理解をして、喜び助け合って生きていくのであります。それは依存とかもたれ合いではありません。共生であります。共生のない自立も、自立のない共生も望ましいものではありません。友愛は人と人との間のみならず国家間にも成り立つ理念です。近代国家は一国のみで存在しうるものではありません。他国とのさまざまな協力や影響のもとに存在をしています。国家としていかに自立性を図りながら他国と共生をしていくかが国家運営にとって最も重要な要素ではないかと思いますその意味で申し上げますと私は現在の日本は米国に依存しすぎておりより重心を韓国や中国などのアジアに移すことが友愛国家となる道であると思います現在のトランプ大統領のアメリカも今申し上げた意味では自国優先でございますので友愛友愛の国家ととはは申し上げることはできません友愛の理念をもっと広く捉えれば人間と自然との間にも成り立つとも言えましょう人間がいかに自立しながら自然と共生できるかは人類にとって最大のテーマでございます政治的にグローバリズムが機能しないでナショナリズムが高揚している現在私たちは何をすればよいのでしょうか私は偏強なナショナリズムを抑えるためには
友愛の理念に基づいてリージョナルな機関を創設をして構成する国がお互いを理解するための場を共有することではないかと思いますいわゆるリージョナリズムの理念に基づいて共同体を構成することです共同体の中では決して武力を使用することをせずあらゆる紛争は徹底的な話し合いで解決するように努力することが肝要でありますなぜなら力の行使は決して紛争の本質的な解決にはならないからであります私はこの友愛の理念に基づいて東アジアが普選共同体になることを夢に見て東アジア共同体を創設するべきであると構想し申し上げてまいりましたすでに ASEAN10 カ国は経済を中心に統合されて経済の意味で共同体が作られておりますまた習近平主席はアジアは運命共同体であり2020年までに東アジア共同体を作りたいとも述べておられます習近平主席は2013年に一帯一路構想を世に問いました途上国のインフラ整備を支援することによって途上国の経済を発展させる構想であります習主席は一帯一路フォーラムにおいてこの構想の目的は第一に平和の構築であり第二が地域の繁栄であると主張されました手段は必ずしも同じではありませんがユーラシア大陸を平和に導きたいとする一帯一路構想と東アジア共同体構想は目的は同じでございます運命共同体を構成する点において一帯一路構想は東アジア共同体構想を包含するある意味で同心円とも言えるでしょう事実李克強首相は昨年の5月来日をされて安倍首相と会談をし日本は一帯一路構想に協力することを約束いたしましたがその際李克強首相は東アジア経済共同体を強調されたのでございますさて ASEAN10 カ国に日本中国韓国の3カ国が加われば東アジア共同体の核が形成をされると思います中国はその意思を示しているのですからあとは日本と韓国の態度であります私は本来日本こそその先頭に立って旗振り役をすべきと考えてまいりましたというのもこの地域では他ならぬ日本が多くの国々とりわけアジア諸国の人々に対して戦争において多大の損害と苦痛を与えた後74年が経った今もなお真の和解が達成されたとは必ずしも考えられないからでございます70年目の節目の年に日本が歴史を正しく見つめて侵略と植民地支配によって苦しめられた人々や国に対してしっかりと謝罪と償いを行うことができていたならば東アジアが共同体に向けて大きく前進できたはずでした私は首相在任中に東アジア共同体を構想することの重要性を訴えてまいりましたそして日韓中三国協力事務所をソウルに設置することができたのでございますが必ずしも初期の目的を果たせずにおりますことは残念でございます日韓中サミットがようやく再開をされて日韓中の協力がさまざまな分野で進められていきますことを心から願っております今韓半島が平和に向けて大きく動き始めましたアメリカと北朝鮮との間には休戦協定が結ばれていますということはいまだに米朝は戦争状態にあります軍事力に圧倒的な差がある状況で終戦を迎えるとしたら北朝鮮は極めて不利になりますそこで3代にわたって北朝鮮は核ミサイル開発を行ってきたのでございます一昨年の暮れにアメリカにまで届くミサイル弾道ミサイルが開発されたと金正恩委員長が判断をしたときに金委員長はこれなら対等に北朝鮮がアメリカと交渉に臨むことができると考えたのではないでしょうか
ある意味でいわば北朝鮮は核ミサイルを捨てるということを武器に交渉に臨んだと言えると思います昨年の4月以降南北首脳会談が何度も開かれ二度目の米朝首脳会談もハノイで開催をされました二度目の米朝首脳会談では何の合意も得られなかったので会談は決裂したとか失敗だったとか否定的な論調が目立ちましたが私はそうは思っておりません北朝鮮が核開発を完全に止めアメリカが経済制裁を完全に解き両国の間に平和条約が締結されるということを目標にした場合1回や2回の首脳会談で結論が出るはずもありません両者がどのように妥協点を見出していくかむしろ今回の会談でその姿がおぼろげながら見えてきただけ良かったのではないかと思っています大事なことは辛抱強く首脳会談を今後とも継続することでありその間は北朝鮮が長距離の弾道ミサイルを発射することはないと願っておりますし米国も北朝鮮を軍事的に攻めることはないでありましょう米朝関係が質的に改善をして韓半島は危機的な状況から出してきているのであると理解をいたします韓国は言うまでもありませんが今こそ日本や中国が韓半島の平和への動きをサポートする姿勢を示すことが重要であります特に日本は韓半島の南北分断に大きな責任を有している国なのでございます安倍首相は拉致問題に固執するあまり当初は対話のための対話は無意味だとかあるいは対話の時代は終わったなどと主張して南北や米朝の対話が進展するにつれて日本は蚊帳の外に置かれてしまいました安倍首相は単にトランプ大統領を全面的に支援するというだけではなくて韓国に積極的に協力する姿勢を示すべきではないでしょうか100年後を見据えれば韓半島はどのような形態であれ一つの国家になっているのでありましょうか数年前までは東アジア共同体構想の中にいかに北朝鮮を組み入れるかは決して容易ではありませんでしたしかし今では南北関係が急進展しており北朝鮮をその枠組みに入れて考えることができるようになったと思います来年チェジフォーラムに北朝鮮を招きたいとの知事が申されたのには私も大賛成でございます私は東アジア共同体の議会を設けそこでは経済貿易のみならず先ほどお話がありました環境問題エネルギー教育文化そして安保などあらゆる文化の議論を行う場とするべきと考えていますが大衆党や沖縄がそのような会議を開催する地域としてふさわしいと私は考えておりますなぜなら日本の沖縄は現在多くの米軍基地の存在により軍事力の要石となってしまっておりますけれども琉球時代のような平和の要石に戻さなければなりませんまたチェジュ島には南北統一の夢をぜひ実現をしていただきたいのであります日本と韓国が中心的な役割を演じながら世界の二大大国の一つとなった中国が経済的にも政治的にも東アジア諸国と平和的に発展していくようにまた北朝鮮が経済的にも政治的にも平和で安定的な国家として発展していくようにそのリード役となるべきと考えておりますそこに成熟した国家となっている日本と韓国の大きな生き様があるように私には思えるのでございます最後にクーデンホフカレルギー博の言葉で締めくくりたいと思います Every great historical happening began as an utopia and ended as a reality ありがとうございました Thank you very much
Thank you, Your Excellency, for your speech this morning. And finally, although His Excellency UN Secretary General Pan Ki moon could not attend, he has personally asked the chief organizer of the Jeju Forum, the president of the Jeju Peace Institute, to deliver his keynote speech. Everyone, let's please give uh, Ambassador Kim Bong Hyun a big round of applause. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and privilege to be invited to the Jeju Forum 2019. I must be here today together with you. However, I could not join you this morning due to unavoidable urgent family matter. I take this opportunity to congratulate all of you, in particular Governor Won Hee Ryong of the Jeju Special Self-Governing Province as well as the incredible people of Jeju Island on the success of this year's forum. It comes at a critical time for both Asia and the world for building resilient peace and prosperity. Since its inception in 2001, the Jeju Forum has been continuously suggesting relevant themes and agenda to the intellectuals of the world and played a leading role in the promotion of cooperation and regional integration in Asia. The role of Jeju Forum is particularly noteworthy as nationalism and isolationism are expanding and eventually threatening multilateralism around the world. Today, I wish to share some insights with you based on my experience as UN Secretary General on how multilateralism should be operating for our peaceful, dynamic and sustainable future, and Asia's leading role to this end. First, I will identify some of the current threats to our multilateral order. Second, I will highlight the universal benefits that the multilateral order brings. And third, I will underline the importance of the role of the emerging powers in the maintenance of multilateralism, as well as the role of Asia in bringing about its future successes. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, threats to the multilateral order are proliferating in tandem with the geopolitical and economic shifts we have witnessed over the last few years. Human rights are under suppression as populist nationalism spreads. Vulnerable populations, including refugees, immigrants, are scapegoated for electoral gain at the domestic level. Development and humanitarian funds are being slashed, unfortunately. Multilateral treaties and bodies, such as the Paris Climate Agreement, the Iran nuclear deal, the UN Human Rights Council, are at risk due to withdrawal from major pledges. The UN Security Council's failure over Syria is one of the most visible examples where failures of the five permanent members of the United Nations to agree to a collective position, which resulted in disastrous and tragic outcome. Meanwhile, the global system of free trade that increases total economic output and stimulates growth is under attack from its greatest benefactors, as US trade wars with China and the European Union are dangerously expanding. In our interconnected world, where long-standing economic ties and integrated global supply chains have contributed to stability and cooperation. Such tensions have the potential to spread beyond trade and negatively impact other areas, including tech and maritime security. Under this backdrop of threats to multilateralism, I firmly believe that we must continue to work together through expanded cooperation, partnership, and regional integration to cope with these pressing challenges. During my 10-year tenure as UN Secretary General, I strived to execute my global leadership duties in support of multilateralism as it brings notable benefits to all. This includes individuals, communities, and states. Multilateralism is clearly in the interest of small states, which benefit from having agreed international rules and institutions where their voices can be heard. 
At the same time, multilateralism is also in the interest of powerful states, as it enables them to shape the international order without resorting to unilateral demonstrations of economic and military might. Multilateral cooperation is also crucial in containing and eliminating the threat of nuclear weapons. The Non-Proliferation Treaty, NPT, has been a powerful, positive example which has helped to contain the spread of nuclear weapons over the last 50 years. It is deeply concerning that the P5 countries of the United Nations are paying little more than lip service to their disarmament commitment under NPT. In this regard, I would like to briefly share my experience in stewarding climate change negotiations during my time leading the United Nations. While climate change was not an explicitly political issue, negotiations were centered on the strategic considerations of big powers, such as the United States and China, as well as the existential considerations of many small island states. I'm incredibly proud of the fact that we unanimously achieved the UN's landmark climate goal and the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015, following a dramatic late night negotiations. This was a resounding victory, not only for our Earth, but for multilateralism as well. The Paris Agreement is one of multilateralism's greatest recent successes and clearly demonstrates that no one country can resolve pressing international challenges alone. But we must go further as Paris is a starting point. Climate change is hindering development and fueling conflict, displacement, and public health risks around the world. These dynamics will continue to worsen in the absence of strong multilateral cooperation and renewed political will. And these threats do not discriminate. Nations both large and small are endangered by them. As the multilateral order and its benefits remain universal, it is imperative that emerging powers should increase their contributions to maintaining this order. The multilateral order centered on the United Nations has at times struggled to properly reflect the changing global power distribution since World War II. Many parts of the world, particularly here in Asia, have seen dramatic economic growth precisely because of the opportunities offered by the multilateral order on trade and globalization. These opportunities have resulted in an explosion of global middle class. They have also drastically scaled up prosperity for countries, businesses, and individuals. In this connection, the emerging powers of today, such as China, India, Korea, Australia, and others, should step forward to contribute more in the maintenance of the same multilateral order that aided their development and increased their international status over the past decades. I hope to see more emerging powers step up in this regard in support of multilateralism. We all stand gain, gain from such efforts as we collecti collectively strive to enhance peace, development, and prosperity across the globe. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as we move forward in the 21st century, we are likely to see a shift towards a multi multipolar world. And Asia's dynamism, innovation, and people power leaves it well positioned to help steer our multilateral future. In an increasingly multipolar and interconnected world, multilateral cooperation in the 21st century will need to be strengthened further in order to deal with an ever-growing number of problems which cut across the national borders. Underpinned by multilateral cooperation, we can realize a peaceful and prosperous Asia, as well as a peaceful and prosperous world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Kim, for delivering uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's keynote address.
And with that, we will conclude the opening ceremony. We will follow this session straight up with the world leader session right after we get the stage ready. So please don't go anywhere. Thank you. Oh, there he is. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished speakers. It is my great pleasure to moderate, moderate uh, this year's World Leaders Session with former President Fisher and former Prime Minister Tombo and former Prime Minister Hatoyama. It is a great uh, disappointment <coughs> and regret that former Secretary General Pan Ki-moon couldn't join us this morning due to uh, sudden illness of his uh, hundred-year-old mother. We all wish her well. Mm. Yeah. Uh, this morning, we have heard uh, four great speeches, very profound and philosophical. Allow me to begin by saying that I agree with many of the points our speakers highlighted in their keynote speeches. President Fisher shared with us the lessons learned from the process of Europe's integration, while Prime Minister Hatoyama stressed the need uh, to establish an Asian community on brotherly love. Former Secretary General Ban, meanwhile, had urged us to restore multilateralism and to cooperate with one another. And Prime Minister Tumble emphasized the importance of the rule-based order and the free and fair trade with opening more markets. I think the common position here is that nationalism is not the way forward. Rather, we need to build an international system and order based on multilateralism and the rule of law. I agree wholeheartedly. But unfortunately, as we witness, the world is going in somewhat opposite direction. The two superpowers, the United States and China, are engaged in tit-for-tat trade war while America has withdrawn from the Iran nuclear deal and what seemed like progress in North Korea's nuclear dismantlement negotiations has turned into a stalemate. Not only that, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change is being seriously challenged with the U.S. set to pull out. Last year, Henry Kissinger warned that the trade dispute between the United States and China will develop into a rivalry for dominance if left unchecked. <clears throat> and as we all know, Kissinger's concerns are turning into reality. At this rate, the post-war international order we've established such as the WTO and Climate Change Agreement, could face serious challenges. Despite these dire circumstances, there appears to be no clear-cut solution to salvage multilateralism. So basically, we are trying to pave a way where there is none at the moment. <coughs> and this is why we need your wisdom, gentlemen. So I'd like to first uh, pose a, a question common to all the panels. <clears throat> it is no e exaggeration to say that the two pillars that pro brought peace and prosperity to the world were the United Nations politically and God, and later the WTO economically. Uh, both were based on the principle of multilateralism, and both were launched with the U.S. taking the lead. But as we all know, since the Trump presidency, 
the U.S. has been acting as a naysayer rather than a leader at the two bodies. Here's the question. Do you think uh, it is possible to revitalize multilateralism without the U.S. leadership and commitment as in the past? Whoever wants to start first, uh, please go ahead. Well, uh, let me just answer briefly. I, U.S. leadership has been absolutely vital, uh, and I wouldn't give up on United States leadership uh, uh, just yet. But I have to say that I, again, repeating what I said in my speech, that the rest of the world needs to be prepared to work together and pursue goals, uh, supporting the rules-based order, supporting <coughs> free trade, supporting open markets, with or without the United States. And the example of the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a very good one. I mean, that was genuine. When I, when I argued we should do the TPP without the United States, I was openly mocked in Australia. I was, I was accused of being embarking on a vanity project, uh, but with persistence and with uh, Japan's uh, support, we were able to get that done. And that's a very, very big deal. And it's one, and what it's created, this is, this is an important part of that, the mm -hmm. TPP-11. It's given the United States a free option. It's not just Korea that can join it at a later date. The UK has expressed interest in joining it but a future American administration mm -hmm. can rejoin, whereas if it had been allowed to die, of course, no one would have had that option. So I, 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 think, we, I, I think you just have to steam ahead and uh, recognize that uh, you know, the current political climate in Washington may not be an enduring one. It's, uh, you can't assume that. Uh, the, the national interest of the United States is in, is in supporting the international rules-based order, and you have to assume at some point, that that will uh, recur. I'm not, I'm not. I might say, the I think the the description, the characterization of President Trump as a threat to the rules-based order or a challenger to the rules-based order is overdone. But I, I won't. Perhaps we can come back to that. I think, uh, you know, the the emphasis on fair trade uh, as well as free trade is is one that's well made. Thank you. Well, Thank you. I, would okay. have, I would have every reason to acknowledge the very important and positive role of the United States after World War II. When I was a schoolboy, uh, <coughs> parcels from the United States, food from the United States was a crucial element of our existence. Mm -hmm. but History is not always developing in a straight way. You, you just before said we mm -hmm. are in a situation uh, where no clear-cut solutions exist. And that is true. Uh, the, the, the distribution of power in the world has changed substantially. It's not the United States on the one side and the Soviet Union on the other side. It's a more multipolar world that <coughs> has developed. And we must accept that human nature is also very diverse. You have lots of good uh, aspects in every human being, and you have incredible bad aspects in human beings. And, and uh, what a nation as such does is a mixture of all these positive and negative feelings and ideas and characters. And so, if you look back on history, it seems always logical why it developed in that way. Even in ancient Greek and Athens and Thucydides, etc., we can analyze it and it seems logical. If you look in the future, it's much less logic. It's much darker. It's much more difficult. Uh, to, to decide what will be in 10, in 20 years. Uh, recently, we had a discussion in Vienna, how could the world look in 100 years? The answer is, we have no idea, not even in 20 years. And uh, all books with, with prognosis from 1980, 
how will life be in 50 years are more or less wrong. So my conclusion is uh, we, we have to reach agreement on some positive goals, on some values, on some things which have to be defended, like rule of law, like the existence of the United Nations and the Human Rights Declaration. And we should do our best uh, to come nearer to these goals. We will never reach them fully. We will always have problems and defeats, but this, the single human being has a responsibility to do its best for a peaceful future. And not less, but not much more can be done, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Hatoyama. では、例えば、北朝鮮との、いわゆる米朝首脳会談はトランプ大統領だったから早く実現したと思っています。これがさらに軍政副合体の上に乗っていた大統領だったら簡単にこのような対話が始まらなかったと思っています。そういう意味で
やり方をすると一つこのなかなか国連全体で議論してもまとまらないことを議論をしてまとめていくことができていくようになるんではないかとそのような提案を申し上げたいと思います。Thank you all for your very wise answers. Let me pick up the point、uh, Prime Minister Hatoyama just、uh, raised、uh, the idea of、uh, establishing the Asian version of EU,、uh, expanding、uh, ASEAN Plus 3、uh, into a kind of、uh, the regional community.、Uh, You know,、uh, China, Korea, and Japan account for a little bit more than 90% of、uh, gross domestic product of、uh, SIM plus three, for example. So, to form an、uh, EU like、uh, community, either that could be an、uh, economic community. Or EU like、uh, more or less、uh, the comprehensive community, it's vital that three nations, namely China, Japan, and Korea, work together in harmony. But we all know that、uh, promoting amicable relations amongst three countries is not a very challenging matter. So, in, in that vein,、uh, may I、uh, ask you an、uh, alternative、uh, view? Namely, many experts have claimed that the US is a non resident Asian state and must be a party to such a community to ensure. China doesn't extend, exert its unilateral dominance in the region. But the problem here is the prevailing view that the US and China cannot avoid heading towards a collision course as、uh, Thucydides' uh, trap uh, indicates. But my question is、uh, do you think an Asian version? Of the European Union can be turned into <coughs> reality without the participation of the United States?、Mm. 私が東アジア共同体という構想をもう2009年総理になるときに提案をしたときにアメリカの方からあかなり、えー、否定的な批判の声が聞こえてまいりました。それはあせっかくオバマ大統領の時に、えー、中国市場などを求めてアジアにアメリカがあ大きく市場を求めていこうとしている時にそれに対してアメリカを排除する論理だということで嫌われましたそれは誤解でございます私はこのどんな国でもすなわちアメリカでもロシアでもモンゴルでも当然この,この東アジア共同体、その名前がそれでふさわしいかどうかは別として、その目的が経済の共同体という以上に、全共同体、EU のように二度と戦争を交えることがない、そういう共同体として作り上げていくとしたときに、あらゆる紛争を決して戦争で解決をしないという。そのことだけは共同体の中で約束をしてもらえる限り私はどんな国でも加盟して構わないと思っているんですその意味でアメリカを排除するつもりもありませんでしたがアメリカ側は排除されると思ってだいぶ鳩山に対して批判的なメッセージが届いていますそのことが結果としてこの基地問題などにも影響を与えたように思っています私はこの中国と韓国と日本との間でなかなか調和が取れていないというのは現実だと思います日中関係もまだ全てが良くなったわけではありません
日韓関係は今かなり政治的にひどい状況になってしまっていますまた中韓の間でもスタードのことでいろいろと問題が山積していると伺っていますこの日中間の参加国の問題日本側から申し上げるとやはり一番は日本側にその責任の大半があってすなわち歴史の事実というものを真剣に見つめてそして日本が過去の戦争において間違った行動をしていたことに対してはバントさんのようにですね、うん、この謝罪する気持ちというものを表すことが大事であると私はこの中で持ち上げたいのは戦争に負けた国が植民地にした国とかあるいは戦争に勝った国に対しては無限責任を負うすなわち相手の人たちがもうこれ以上謝らなくてもいいよと言っていただけるまで心の中で謝罪する気持ちを持ち続けるということが大事であると思っていますその気持ちがなかなか日本側から韓国や中国の指導者に十分に伝わっていないために日中間の問題が調和が取れていない本当はこの日中間が例えば経済問題において調和が取れていれば日本は資本財が得意韓国は中間財が得意あるいは中国は消費財が得意このように分業体制ができるような状況がありますしたがってウィンウィンウィンの関係というのは民間の企業においては十分にできる状況であるのにもかかわらず政治的に冷え切ってしまっているというのは非常に残念なことであってそのことを解決するために私はヨーロッパの歴史に日本はもっと学ぶべきではないかと思っています。Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And、uh, as a Korean, we appreciate what you have just said about the history issue. I think if we had one more Hatoyama, then Asian issues will be get resolved much more easily.、Mm. Well, <laughs> we, go. we need to clone you. Just、uh, going back to this、uh, issue of、uh, having U.S. as a member of the uh, potential uh, uh, Asian community, may I turn to uh, uh, Prime Minister t o m b o l because you're an important member of Asia Pacific Nations. What do you think of it? Well, the, the United States、uh, is a Pacific power, it is part of the, it is an Asia Pacific、uh, power and、uh, <clears throat> An Asia Pacific economy, it is present、uh, in our region,、uh, both militarily and, of course,、uh, economically. And the stability that's been provided to the region by the presence of American military power in support of the values of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law,、uh, the, the United States has been the sheet anchor. Of that rule of law in our region. And were it not for the enduring presence of the United States in our region, how could you, can you genuinely believe that we would have had the economic growth we've had? Can you genuinely believe that China, for that matter, would have had the economic growth it has had? So I think, you know, for all of the ups and downs and twists and turns in American politics and American politicians and American presidents,、uh, the reality is that the, imp the impact of the US、mm. in the region in the years since the Second World War has been overwhelmingly positive, and particularly in the last 40 odd years since the end of the Vietnam War, the,、uh, it, has, it has provided that stability. It's been the great enabler of the economic growth we've had. So,、uh, You know, that you can see what my answer is. I think the US has to be part of it. But I think to be, to be realistic, however,、uh, it's one thing to have a trade deal. And, you know, I've, I've certainly discussed with Chinese leaders the prospect of China at some point joining the TPP. I think that, you know, again, I, I think that's, that would be a great aspiration. But in terms, the European Union, as President Fisher knows very well, is a, 
is a political union. It's not just an, it's not just an economic union. It's not just a customs union. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the difference in political values between Korea and Japan on the one hand and China on the other, uh, not to speak of even the countries uh, within uh, ASEAN have got, you know, you go from very vibrant democracies like Indonesia to, to one-party states <coughs> to even to Brunei Darussalam, which is a monarchy. Uh, so, you know, I think the, you need to have, for a political union, you need to have shared political values uh, and that is, you know, that just does not exist uh, in, um, you know, in, in East Asia or indeed even okay. in ASEAN. So uh, I think uh, economic union or economic, um, greater economic integration, greater, uh, greater move towards free trade and open yeah. markets is desirable, but it has to be a level playing field. And I mean, this is, can I just make this one point about trade? President Trump, when he talks about trade and China, talks all the time about the deficit. That, that is not the, that's not the right analysis. I mean, the, the, whether you have a deficit or a surplus should be a function simply of comparative advantage. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't, it, it's, uh, you know, we have a, a big deficit with the United States. We don't think our trade is uh, unfair. We have a big surplus. Uh, with Japan, and indeed we have a surplus with Korea, neither Japan nor Korea thinks the trade is unfair. The critical thing is, is it a level playing field? Is it fair trade? Uh, and that's what the TPP was, is designed to do. So I think that's what the focus should be on, because you've always got a moral platform if you say trade should be fair. In other words, the rules that apply on my side apply on your side. That's fair. If you simply say, I want you to buy more of my stuff uh, because the deficit's too big, that, that looks very self-interested. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like now turn to President Fisher. Uh, we uh, learned three lessons from your observation of the process of uh, European integration in the past few decades. I think uh, as uh, Prime Minister Hatoyama uh, pointed out that uh, Asian nations uh, should learn more from European experiences. But from, uh, you know, devil's advocate's point of view, I think Asia uh, is uh, very different from Europe. Uh, to, to name a few, uh, Asian nations are very diverse in terms of, uh, say, size of population and in terms of uh, income disparities, by, by that I mean uh, per capita GDP, is very diverse uh, as different from uh, in Europe. And Europe <coughs> enjoys uh, Christianity as the backbone of their, own, uh, their culture. But in Asia, uh, we have all different kind of re religions and different cultural heritage. Uh, given, given these preconditions, do you think uh, it's still a good idea that we, uh, we pursue some kind of uh, community? And is it, is it realizable <coughs> in reality? Uh, I'd like to take the wisdom of you. Mm. If you say some kind of community, I react positive because this is a vision, this is a goal that inspires us. I believe that for, a, for such a community, you need first the strong will of all participants to achieve it. They must have a united will, a united goal. And secondly, uh, you must know that's a long way because the history of the European community is now almost 70 years. And as it was said already uh, several times, it, it, it based on the idea we had wars between uh, Germany and France at the end of the uh, 18th century, at the beginning of the 19th century, the war of 1870, the war of 1914, the war of 1945, every time catastrophic developments. So we must overcome it. And the idea was 
to connect the economies uh, between different European countries so closely that uh, the reason or even the possibility for war is almost excluded. They started with six countries and the goal was an economic union. Then it expanded to nine. Then it expanded to 12. Then it became more and more a political union because economic cooperation and political cooperation have a lot in common. And then it was the goal, the far goal, to create United States of Europe, similar to the United States of America. Then the communist systems were collapsing. The European Union was expanding on 15 members. This was the round where Sweden, Finland, and Austria came to the European Union. And then was the big jump forward with 12 new members from 15 to 27. And this changed the structure of the European Union. The United States of Europe are not anymore a goal. One is more reluctant. And uh, this shows me that uh, if you have a goal of the United, this United States of Asia, Asian community, as you said it, uh, you, you, you have to start with a first step, then a second step, then a third step. And your crucial question, whether the United States could be in or out, I would say these are not the only two options to have them, so to say, totally in or totally out. I could imagine that uh, such an Asian community is combined of a nucleus of countries which are ready for a very close cooperation and they have partners, close partners, and they shape a special relation to the United States. The United States are so important that uh, they can't be ignored, as you just have said. But whether it will work if, if the United States are in from the very beginning, I don't want to, to give a judgment. I don't know the relations and the situation in Asia enough. But uh, as I said, it can be step by step, and it can be with a special relationship to the United States to make it as realistic as possible. Thank, thank you, President Fischer. Uh, now we are running out of time, so I'd like to pose a question to uh, Prime Minister Hatoyama on, on China, because uh, today's topic is uh, Asia towards resilient peace. But I think if we really uh, consider the rising China in perspective, then there's no point of discussing Asia towards resilient peace. Uh, so I think let me pose a question in Korean. I think Korean Ch Japanese translation is much more efficient <laughs> than English Japanese. Uh, uh, Asia community, Chichangu, 많은 감명을 받, 받았고 오늘 특히 그 스피치에서 그 우회의 개념이 에, 국가와 국가 간 인간과 인간 간을 넘어서 인간과 자연에도 적용될 수 있다는 말씀에서 정말 더 깊은 감명을 받았고 아마 21세기에 에, 아마 굉장히 중요한 화두가 될 거라고 생각합니다. 그리고 이제 아까 스피치에서도 무슨 말씀을 하셨냐면은 일본이 미국에 너무 
경도되어 있다. 디펜던스가 너무 강하다 이런 말씀을 하시면서 그렇기 때문에 한국과 중국을 중심으로 한 이런 커뮤니티 빌드업의 중요성을 그렇게 말씀하시고 지금 일대일로 소비 원벨원 로드 거기에 대한 이제 그 개념이 이 우회 개념에서 통합될 수 있다 아, 그런 말씀을 하셨습니다. 그런데 이제 에, 아까 이전 세션에서도 그 앨리슨 교수하고 리자우싱 장관하고의 대담에서도 나왔습니다만은 이 소위 일대일로를 어떻게 보느냐 하는 것이 중요할 것 같아요. 그, 이 과거의 그 위대함을 다시 찾겠다는 중국의 꿈이 그 주변 국가 입장에서 볼 때는 그 중, 중화주의를 중심으로 하는 그 새로운 신, 중국식 신질서 구축. 으로도 해석될 수 있는 것은 우리가 저 부정할 수 없을 것 같아요. 그래서 이제 이러한 그 일대일로의 정책이 이 아시아 커뮤니티에 긍정적으로 작용하기 위해서 또 지금 할아버지 때부터 주창해 오시는 우회와 상생의 개념에 부합되는 일대일로를 만들기 위해서 과연 주변국들이 이 그런 역할을 중국에 만들어 갈수 있는지 그것이 첫 번째 질문이고 두 번째는 이제 이런 구상과 관련해서 일본의 이제 주도적 역할을 강조하셨습니다. 특히 역사적 어떤 그 주변국에 끼친 그런 거에 대한 그 사주의 의미로서도 이런 일본의 주도적 역할을 주창하셨는데 현재 일본의 분위기에서 그것이 과연 가능한지. 그리고 이뭐 지금은 아니더라도 5년 후 10년 후에 과연 일본에서 그런 움직임이 일어날 수 있다고 보시는지 좀 솔직한 견해를 듣고 싶습니다. 예, 難しい 질문을 받았습니다. 어, かつて私どもの家においでいただいた時 にのお話をされましたけれどもそこの彦馬に和を持って東と死となすという私の祖父一郎の最後の書その後数日後に亡くなりましたが最後の書が掲げてあります私は西洋と東洋の思想あるいは人間性の違いというものを申し上げるとその論語の中にある和を尊としとなすという和を持って尊としとなすという考え方がこの東洋人にはかなり徹底して理解されることだと思っていますそれはその先ほどお話がありましたように西洋においてはかなり共通性があるけれども東アジアにはあまり共通性
その共同体ができるのではないかと思っているんです。経済だけではなくて、政治的な意味での重要性を持った共同体を東アジアに作ることが、むしろ東アジアだからこそできるのではないかとむしろ思っています。さてそこで中国ですが、私は昨年の12月に習近平主席にお会いをして、これは20人ぐらいの元指導者の方々と一緒にお会いした時にアジアを代表して話せというので申し上げたことがありますそれは私は一帯一路という構想を習主席が2年前の一帯一路フォーラムの時に一番の最大の目的は平和の構築であるとおっしゃったことを支持したいと。第2番目に地域の繁栄であるということを申された。第1がまさに平和の構築であるとするならばそのことを指示をしたいそこで私は一帯一路の構想というのはぜひ友愛の精神で張っていただき進めていただきたいとその一帯一路の構想を友愛の理念で進めるというのはむしろ論語の中にある人という考え方とかあるいは「感情の「女」ですけれども「女」という言葉の中に表されているんだと自分が目立とうと思った時には他人を先に目立たせてあげなさいとかあるいは自分が嫌がることは人にはするなよというようなことが書かれている。でこれがまさに、えー、中国のそそれこそ古い伝統の中で育まれている考え方ではないかとぜひこういう考え方で一帯一路構想を進めていただきたいということを申し上げたら習主席は鳩山の言う通りであるという愛人と女の考え方で一帯一路構想を進めたいという話をされました私はこういうような指導者すなわち習主席のように中国の古典にも十分に理解のある指導者がこのトップに立たれて一帯一路構想を進めていかれるならば決してそれは覇権主義という形ではないだろうとむしろみんなと共和をして協調していける体制を作ることができるのではないかと思っています。この今まだかつて中国は他国に対して侵略をしたことはない少なくとも漢民族の DNA の中にはそのような侵略的な思想を持ったことはないんだと万里の長城も相手から自らを守るためにあるものであって自分たちから攻めるためのものではないんだということを主張されました。私はそのような考え方で中国が歩んでいくことを期待しますしそうであることを強く願っていますそうである以上私は一帯一路構想というものにむしろ韓国や日本が積極的に協力をするべきではないかとそのように考えます。Well, thank you. I'd like to give, we just ran out of time, but I'd like to give final concluding remarks from、uh, Prime Minister Tom Boland. And President Fisher.、Oh, well, well, thank you.、Uh, look, I, I've, I, we're running out of time, but I'd just say、uh, I think that uh, uh, Prime Minister Hatoyama's,、uh, just noting your description of,、uh, of uh, Chinese history, I do, I'll just make one, one observation.、Uh, the China suffered during its、uh, century. Centuries of humiliation from a number of unequal treaties um, uh, and uh, with a number of、uh, foreign powers, including Japan, of course, and Russia and Britain and even the United States.、Um, and it, in 2004, it set, China settled the boundaries with Russia,、uh, which、um, had been.、Uh, Had seen back in the 18s, in 1850s and 60s large chunks of China actually appropriated to Russia. The Amurskaya province, for example, in Siberia was originally Chinese territory. 
Anyway, the borders were settled very practically and, uh, and pragmatically. And uh, that was, I, I thought that was a very encouraging sign. Um, the, the current, the approach of China today, of Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping today, with respect to, for example, the, South, the uh, South China Sea is quite different. Uh, there isn't, uh, there, there is an absolutist approach uh, and unilateral island building and militarization of uh, features in the South China Sea, which has caused considerable tension. Um, so I would hope that the uh, very optimistic view that uh, uh, Prime Minister Hatayama described uh, will be borne out, but I would hope that China would uh, uh, go back to taking that very pragmatic uh, approach that it showed in 2004, rather than the uh, very high pressure approach that it is taking uh, with regional disputes today. <clears throat> well, I, I just want to say I I was, I am, and I think I will remain an ardent supporter of multilateralism. Multilateralism helps to organize in different regions and to solve problems, not on a national level, but on a multilateral level. Secondly, uh, there was an Austrian philosopher, his name is Charles Popper. You may know him, his books on the open society, and one of his sentences reads, I may be right and you may be wrong. You may be right and I may be wrong. But together we can come nearer to the truth. And this is the spirit in which uh, international dialogue, international organizations should uh, talk to each other and that would bring us forward and not a dogmatic position on this or that question. And finally, I want to thank the Jeju Forum. Yes. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, we feel sorry that uh, we couldn't invite the floor to engage with the uh, three great panels because of uh, lack of time. But why don't you give a uh, big applause to great panels today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen.